Content warnings. I will be discussing explicit trans misogyny, transphobia, misgendering, conversion therapy, Ray Blanchard, autogynephilia, sex, TERFs, misogyny, anti-trans discrimination, detransition, and domestic violence. Disclaimer, I'm going to speak critically of some online figures. I do not condone or endorse anyone to contact or engage with these individuals, especially to send any kind of harassment. I'm coming out of my post-op recovery early to put the foot down. The topics here are all so incredibly nuanced that I feel like I can make long projects out of most of the words I'm about to say here, but this is urgent. I'm here to quickly and firmly stand against this behavior to hopefully stop what I'd like to call fragile transmasculinity in its tracks. If you're fortunate enough to not exist in trans Twitter spheres, please enjoy yourself and keep it that way, but you'll need this context. So, adult film star turned questionable Twitter advertiser and renowned speaker of not good takes, Mr. Buck, transsexual man, Angel, and some of his friends released a letter with the Gender Dysphoria Alliance Canada. Yes, Scott lives in Texas and Buck lives in California. No, this doesn't get any more logical as we go on. But this letter titled, Trans Men Fight Back, in summary, digs up Ray Blanchard's defunct theories to claim that trans women attracted to women, literally calling them heterosexual males, are erotically self-attracted people who have abused and silenced us for years in order to control the narrative. So what abuse have they supposedly perpetuated that has these individuals so riled up? Well, they created the gender identity narrative. They are anti-conversion therapy, which is very cutely put in quotation marks as if it shouldn't be called that, saying it's a solid alternative treatment for being trans. They erase women's spaces and language somehow and are behind transhumanism. Well, very conveniently, no contextualization or examples of these accusations are provided anywhere aside from a random Wikipedia article link. So, if you take their word for it and have homosexual GD, meaning you're a trans man who likes women or a trans woman who likes men, or one of the well-behaved AGPs, they invited you to join them. How sweet. It's important to know that Buck is bisexual, so guess they graciously allowed him in. It's interesting how the focus is on vilifying trans women who like women, but there's really no mention of trans men who like men, ending the world with cybernetics or whatever. Hmm. Backtracking for our last piece of context, I'll go back to the AGP acronym and Ray Blanchard. Ray Blanchard, recently known for endorsing an article claiming anime turns people trans, in 1989 made his theory to contradict the accepted model that a trans person's gender identity and sexual orientation were unrelated. He focused on trans women, claiming there was two key kinds, trans women who transitioned to avoid being gay for liking men, and all other kinds of trans women, who transitioned because they were attracted to the idea of becoming a woman, aka those with autogynephilia, aka AGP. This theory is debunkable in various ways, especially considering the fact that many cisgender women have sexual fantasies tied to being feminine. Many cisgender people have a fantasy of cross-dressing or swapping bodies. This theory plays right into the over-sexualization of trans women that TERFs often rely on to try to prove that trans women are somehow sexual deviants or perpetuators. To understand more on this, please check below for links and articles by the amazing Julia Serrano. Now, with the full picture, it's easy to see the issue is, let's sacrifice trans women and show TERFs we like this bad scientist they love so they can take us true transsexuals seriously. Obviously, these are some extreme viewpoints that don't represent trans men or trans masculine people as a whole, but it does highlight the dangers and reality of unchecked trans misogyny spread in trans spaces. Some of the response to this letter in the trans masculine community have absolutely highlighted this issue.
That's mainly my goal today, to point out transmasculine fragility and how it's a reaction to transmisogyny and conversations around it. As someone who is transmisogyny exempt, TME, it's crucial for me to stand against this behavior, condemn the AGP theory, oppose transmisogyny, and show open ears and solidarity to transmisogyny affected TMA people. Being TME doesn't suddenly, or ever for that matter, claim that I've never experienced misogyny, transphobia, or any hardships at all in my life. All TME means is I haven't experienced trans misogyny specifically. I'm exempt from it. It's literally nothing more. So let's define trans misogyny to better understand this. Trans misogyny was coined back in 2007 by Julia Serrano in her book Whipping Girl and is hard to wrap up in a concise definition. We live in a society that treats manhood as the peak of the gender lottery, the strongest, the most fortunate, and the most privileged, the best gender to be. Misogyny itself tells us that womanhood and femininity are feeble, incapable, and unwanted. Serrano gracefully walks us through how in this system there is no greater threat than trans femininity to be born with male privilege and to choose to reject it, offending the supremacy manhood is supposed to have. With this in mind, trans femininity is more subversive as trans masculinity can be societally rationalized as sympathetic to those born without male privilege, choosing to escape misogyny through manhood, proving manhood's perks. So trans misogyny specifically targets and condemns trans feminine people because of that accused subversion of male supremacy and misogyny towards their femininity slash womanhood. Because of these ideals, different transitions face different discrimination. Serrano tells us how trans feminine people face a disproportionate amount of social attention and demonization due to their perceived threat to masculinity, while trans masculine people alternatively go overlooked in comparison. We see that in action in the trans men fight back letter. I call this situation for trans masculine people backhanded privilege, as we often go ignored and infantilized in comparison. This gives us more benefit of the doubt and less targeted harassment, but in no way makes our situation good, let alone ideal whatsoever. The letter tries to work with that benefit of the doubt, hoping that equipping trans misogynistic talking points, it can play on that transphobic sympathy to hopefully gain some points. That right there is just a part of trans masculine fragility I want to call out here. Trans men fight back is a more blatantly evil example of playing rather directly into explicit transphobia. But there's a common, subtle issue too. Some trans men and trans masculine people seem to think that even bringing attention to trans misogyny is somehow an erasure of their struggles or an invitation to debate who subjectively has it worse among trans identities. I'll say it now, it's not. A good example of this is the infamous trans man reads detransition baby Twitter thread. I really can't prepare you for the amount of sheer entitlement you're about to see. It's hard for me to even understand this was genuinely written and not satire. It's not as much of a review as it is a trans misogynistic manifesto, and this screenshot sums up the situation fairly well. This just seems like giving away the plot, rather than a review. Correct! Essentially, our protagonist, Evan, here went into Tori Peters' national best-selling book, Detransition Baby, with the quest to not necessarily read it, but to critique it for its transmasculine representation. All at the same time, Peters was receiving threats from groups who believe she shouldn't have received a nomination for the Women's Prize for Fiction because she is trans. You'll notice Evan is great with coincidental timing like this. With this information alone, it makes our game of spotting trans misogyny fairly easy, but it only gets worse from here. Just a few tweets in, we get this disclaimer to set the tone. This poor book, it really doesn't deserve me as an audience, named least likely to care about romance and babies by my middle school class. Me. If only it had like one spaceship or a few robots or was set in Africa. I'm really going to be nice. I promise. I... Uh, 
Hmm. Well, if we can recover from that horrible start, we can somehow see it devolve further. To finish, I should talk about how the book views detransition. Peters describes it thus. The purview of conversion therapists and tabloid headlines, the topic of detransition was boring. The reasons for it were never complex. Life as a trans woman was difficult. There's little more, but this quote captures the tone. No mention of anything other than self-hating, recloseted trans women, which is, of course, what the book is about. Though I suppose one can't help but find it a teensy bit lacking in full encapsulation. There's no need to belabor this point, though. The book doesn't mention exactly how detransition is treated in the tabloid headlines or who apart from trans women might be most hurt by this. It also has the word detransition in the title. Unless that changes, I won't revisit. Evan, this book is focused on, and about women. I'd call this a reminder, but he never seemed to actually get that in the first place. Reese then goes on this head trip about how being hit proves her womanhood, and honestly, I didn't get it. If it resonates with trans women, then I have nothing to say in contrast. It doesn't ring even a little true to me as a trans man who's been hit, but why would it? Yeah, you're really backing up my point here, buddy. Can we please just take the book at face value instead of how it should be applied to you and your masculinity? So anyway, the trans girl parts were very alienating, just made me despise the character. I kept being pulled out by wondering if people could possibly find them realistic. But it did connect on enough of a level for me to want to give the benefit of the doubt to Peters. Well, there we go. My question is answered. No, he cannot just take a trans woman writing for what it is. Gotta cater to Evan, or it's despicably unrealistic because it's Evan's world after all. Well, this is obviously just a very small chunk of the thread, but it shows well enough the entitlement of wanting to be a part of personal trans feminine conversations, talking over and devaluing their experiences because of your focus on your own. Especially with the knowledge of harassment Peters was facing, seeing that and turning it into, but does she care about my feelings in her book? If this didn't aggravate you enough, don't worry. He did something similar after the trans men fight back letter. As you can guess, that letter has sparked larger conversations about trans misogyny, especially how it appears in trans spaces from TME people, and Evan successfully proved it with another great example through his behavior. In this tale, Evan finds a thread by Kai where she calls for unity, pointing out harmful transmisogynistic stereotypes and violence that trans femmes face. Over halfway through, as Kai begins to speak about her personal experiences in seeing transmasculine people in places of privilege and power, that sends our friend Evan reeling into another poorly received thread. Don't worry, before this thread, Evan did do his little dose of, don't worry, I'm not trans misogynistic, and signed a wonderful little letter. I signed this. I don't think trans men should have to apologize whenever a trans man acts like a dick, but since Buck Angel, etc., purported to be speaking for trans men, it's worth getting as many names as possible on the record, saying they can't speak for us. So don't worry, he's... He's not trans misogynistic, guys. I was so worried. But the thread. I know people are hurting, but the people in the trans community who have attained relatively higher levels of wealth and power are white trans women, and I don't see how I can pretend it's trans men. I'm afraid to say this publicly because I fear it will hurt my own career prospects, but the handful of trans people who have achieved any respect are trans women. I don't think I can pretend that's not the case. For instance, the only trans person with a New York Times opinion column is a trans woman. It's Jenny Boyland. She's great. I don't begrudge her anything. But if you look at journalism, you can easily name three or four prominent trans women. Trans men are nobodies. It's not even close. I don't say this to begrudge anyone or their success. I think trans misogyny is awful and we need to be aware of it and condemn it. But trans women seem to think trans men have some kind of power or privilege and I, I think I might need some proof. 
because my observations might be wrong. Please, correct me. But I don't count many trans men in positions of power or wealth. There aren't a lot of trans people in such positions, but of those there are, it's not mostly trans men. I know that trans men have the word man in our identity, but I'm asking you to consider for one moment that it might not be worth a hill of beans. The visibility trans feminine people have is something I'd also describe as a backhanded privilege. Sure, there's more awareness of trans femininity and more available representation, but it comes at the cost of being at the forefront and disproportionate focus of transphobic onslaughts of criticism, rage, and violence. We don't benefit from defensively debating who has it worse, but we need to understand our experiences are not all the same. We need to listen, self-reflect, and be willing to admit we do not and cannot know everything. We need trans feminine people to feel safe enough to talk about their hardships, and we need to understand that making space isn't an attack on trans masculine people. So, what's the moral of my story here? Take and reflect on those examples of trans misogyny. Don't engage with those people, but learn from their actions and avoid them for yourself. Hold your TME peers accountable. Don't excuse or ignore trans misogyny when you see it. Most importantly, go listen to trans feminine people. Go uplift their stories, their voices, and show them some positivity. Let them guide and have these conversations as they are the ones that trans misogyny affects. And go buy yourself a copy of Whipping Girl and Detransition Baby. Thanks for watching.